screen sharing. So the topic of today is Young Permanent Tooth to Mature Tooth. So what exactly is Young Permanent Tooth? Young Permanent Tooth is a tooth which is newly erupted into the oral cavity. A tooth which has been newly erupted into the oral cavity and which root and the crown is not fully formed. Crown in a sense means the uh, enamel, enamel rods are completely not fully developed. And the root is a portion which is not completed. So in today's session, I'll be dealing more with the apical part of the management of the apical part of the permanent young permanent tooth. That is the root part of the young permanent tooth. So what all types of uh, cases we can get it? That is the one with open apex, what you can see over here. And in the permanent tooth also, that is young permanent molar also. And in these two cases, what you can see is that the orifice or the apical area is very wide and the remaining dentin on either side is very thin, which make our treatment difficult. And in the case of permanent tooth also, you can see that the apical part is wide open where you cannot uh, do an obturation, proper obturation, or you cannot seal that particular area. And if at all we seal it also, the remaining dentin, which is available over there is comparatively less, which make our treatment more complicated. So the root apex is not closed in case of any permanent tooth. It takes around one and a half to two years for the completion of the root formation. Bye. So what type of, so in the, this radiograph, what you can see is that in the radiograph, you can see the root is almost closed, but still we cannot proceed with our normal root canal treatment. Here also you can see that the root is closed, but in this case, this is a two dimensional picture, what you can get of a three dimensional object. The mesodistally, it, it seems that the root is closed. And if you proceed, or if you proceed saying that I can go for a root canal, conventional root canal treatment on this particular case, sometimes we may go wrong. Why? Because it has happened for one or two cases of uh, my personal cases, I have got, uh, gone wrong. Because by seeing this, I'll say that I'll go for the uh, normal root canal treatment. But once I do my uh, biomechanical preparation, I could feel that the apex is not closed because buccolingually it may not be completely closed. So if mesodistally the root is being closed, as in this particular radiograph, buccolingually it will take another three to six months to completely close. So when you are planning for a treatment or when you are explaining about the treatment plan to the parent, you need to explain about this also. If the apex is open, I may need to go for an apexification because uh, we all know that it is very difficult to convince the parent about the root canal treatment on young permanent tooth. Mostly when it is a young permanent molar, they'll say that the tooth is not exfoliated. This is not the new, new, new tooth. It is there in the oral cavity. It will be very tough for us to explain that this is a new tooth which has been erupted in the oral cavity by around six years of age and it will not exfoliate. It is a permanent tooth. And after convincing that, again, in between, if we want to change our treatment by saying that apexification is required or something like that, it will be difficult. So whenever you see a case, something like this, which is almost closed also, you need to inform the parent that there can be chances that apical area will be open buccolingually. So you might need to use some apexification procedure or might need to use MTO, any such agent in while doing the procedure. So what all types of young permanent tooth, or what all types of apices you can see? So one is non-blunderbus canal. Or in this, what you can see that the, both the sides of the canal are tapering, but at the same time, it is open. Means the orifice or the canal is constricting, but it is not completely closed. 
And at the same time, we have another type of canal or another type of apex where the apex is wide open or funnel shaped. That is, the apex is wider in the apical part than in the coronal orifice or orifice part. So it is wide open. That is called as blunderbuss canal. So we have non blunderbuss canal and blunderbuss canal. So that is, uh, there is some importance in the management of blunderbuss and non blunderbuss canal that I'll be talking in the uh, I mean, say, uh, this one slides. So if this blunderbuss has, the name has combined, uh, came from a Dutch weapon called as Dondabus, where you can see that the uh, opening or the end of that particular weapon is wide open. So it is a funnel shape. From that word, this Dondabus has come. So Trek has defined different types of apical opening. That is stage one, that is root formation, that is less than half, stage two, more than half, stage three, two third of the root form, stage four, almost root completed, and stage five, root is completed. So I'll be dealing in these three areas, that is stage one, two, three, until up to four. The management of these all type of apical areas or root apexes. So I'll be explaining about what all treatment options are available, what all treatment modalities are available, etc. about on this particular session. So normally in a clinical situation, what we can see is that we can see a fracture of anterior tooth because of trauma. This is a common uh, sequence, what you can see. That might be around, uh, around seven or eight years of age when the permanent tooth has erupted in the oral cavity, immediately the tooth might have fractured. This can be because of the proclined upper anterior teeth, one reason. Another reason, the child might be involving the active sports, that is contact sports or something, cycling or contact sports or something like that, that lead to fall and thereby breaking the prominent uh, area of the oral cavity or the prominent area of the face that is a tooth with that fracture. And once we take up a radiograph, we can see that the apex is wide open, making it our management little complicated. This is in the case of an anterior tooth. Same in the case of the molars also. This is a very commonly seen situation nowadays, that is molar incisor hypomineralization. That is hypomineralization incisors and molars. And these molars, what you can see is that Immediately within a span of one year, you can see complete breakdown of the enamel or caries exposure or post enamel breakdown you can see. This might be because that the enamel over there is hypomineralized and because of the hypomineralized enamel over there, the caries or there will be plaque accumulation and the plaque accumulation, the caries will be progressing much more faster leading to the pulpal exposure and making the treatment very complicated or the root canal treatment complicated. And this, rather than a dental caries, dental caries will take some time. So, for example, if it is a dental caries on the pit surface of the tooth, so it will take some time for it to reach the uh, pulp and then infecting the pulp, it will take a longer time. So, by the time the root might have completely developed. But in the molar incisor hypomineralization, it will be much more faster in this particular scenario. And thereby, there will be, uh, you might need to go for a root canal treatment or some difficult, complicated treatment for this particular tooth. So these are the two conditions which we normally call, uh, see or we will come across when you uh, think about young permanent tooth. That is fractured upper anterior teeth because of trauma or very rarely you see the caries uh, involvement and thereby uh, management of the upper anterior teeth. But the lower or uh, the upper molars, you can see the post enamel caries breakdown because most commonly it is because of the molar incisal hypomineralization. What are the problems associated with open apex? Normally what we can encounter? The root canal filling which we cannot confine within the root. What you can see over here is that there are voids in between. We cannot get a hermetic seal at the apex. So without a hermetic seal, there can be chances of seepage of the fluid, oral fluids to the apex and also fluids from the Periapical area can also seep in and thereby leading to infection. That is one reason, one complication what you can get with the help of the open apex. Another one is that short crown root ratio. In this picture, what you can notice is that the crown length, that is, this is almost the crown length, what you can see, approximately same crown length only is there for the root portion also. That crown root ratio is comparatively less. 
so that if at all we do any root canal treatment or if you augment the root or if you do an apexification, the longevity of that particular tooth in the oral cavity will be compromised. Or if you're placing a crown on that particular tooth, chance of fracture of that particular tooth will be much more when compared to the immature tooth. So that is one thing what, which complicates our uh, treatment. That is, we cannot get a hermetic seal. And another one is that short crown root ratio. And along with that, the either side, the dentinal tubules or uh, dentin, what you can see is that our remaining dentin is comparatively very less, which makes the tooth very friable to fracture. So very prone to fracture. So when coming to the management, around seven or eight years, normally it is tough to manage these children because they know about the treatment modalities in the industry. And most often what you can see is that at that particular age, it will be very difficult for them to behaviorally manage them. So uh, they show the temper tantrums, uh, they show all the types of uh, behavior uh, difficulties, and we cannot hold them or we cannot restrain them and do the procedure. So it is very tough at this particular age to manage the child. And another important difficulty what you notice is that, as I mentioned before, young permanent tooth. This case also very difficult to get anesthesia. But in the anterior tooth, it may not be that difficult. Once you give a block or once you give an infiltration, you might be able to get the sufficient anesthesia. But in the case of an young permanent molar, it will be difficult to get anesthesia. Why? Because, because of the molar incisal hypomineralization, there will be chronic inflammation will be there. Because of the chronic inflammation on that particular tooth, the pulp will be inflamed. And because of the inflamed pulp, our LA or the local anesthesia won't act properly. So how much of a local anesthesia you load on that particular case, you may not be able to get the sufficient anesthesia. And if you don't get a proper anesthesia, our treatment fails or you don't get the cooperation for the child, we cannot do a proper treatment on this case. So what possibility is there, or what alternative is there to get a proper anesthesia for this? One thing normally what we do, that is block injection in an, uh, what is periodic cases. Normally the injection needle is 25 gauge, one inch needle. Since that needle is not available in our market, uh, especially in India, it's not available. So we used to go for 24 one-inch one needle for pediatric cases. So this one-inch needle, one-inch length needle may not be sufficient enough to anesthetize an young permanent, a seven or eight-year-old uh, boy, a boy or a girl, where you require one and a half inch needle. So that is available in 26 gauge, one and a half inch needle has to be used in this case. Then again, and another local anesthesia. And what you can do is that, suppose when you're examining the case, when excavating this lesion, if the patient gives or shows sensitivity, then we can assume that that tooth is inflamed or that tooth is literally bit inflamed. We can assume that the tooth is inflamed clinically. And what we can do is that before planning to go for any excavation or any endodontic procedure or any pulpal procedure, it will be better, we'll go for a, a pre-medication, pre-medication with an anti-inflammatory, either a diclofenac sodium or IBGC paracetamol combination drug can be given 30 minutes to one hour before the procedure. So that will reduce your, what is that, pain threshold, inflammation, and along with that, you can get a proper anesthesia. So that can be tried, if you feel that the tooth is inflamed and if you have difficulty in getting anesthesia. And the anesthetic agent also you can change it. That is, we can go for RTK along with your lignocaine, lignocaine block, we can give RTK infiltration both on the buccal and on the lingual side. Buccal area itself is sufficient. The advantage of giving RTK is that RTK can penetrate through the bone and reach the periapical area. And it is much more potent than our local, that is lignocaine anesthesia. Or else we can go for the periodontal ligament injections also with RTK. 4% RTK can be used, but the dose has to be reduced when compared to that of the um, uh, yeah, um, lignocaine. That is half the dose only you need to give for in the case because it is 4%. But if you give this uh, RTK along with the local anesthesia, 
you can get uh, sufficient anesthesia for opening up of the pulse chamber or doing a respiratory treatment. So your options are, we can pre-medicate. Suppose if you feel that the tooth is little inflamed, we can go for pre-medication with an anti-inflammatory drug, that is diclofenac is a good choice, or else brufen plus paracetamol. That brufen will give the anti-inflammatory, the paracetamol will reduce your pain, this one, both centrally and locally. So brufen paracetamol combination or diclofenac can be pre-medicated 30 minutes before the procedure and your local anesthesia, normal 2% uh, lignocaine can be given as a block injection. And along with that, if you're not getting sufficient anesthesia, you can go for articane infiltration onto the buccal area. And before proceeding to take the aerotab, make sure that you'll get all the objective and subjective symptoms of the anesthesia. Because once you uh, take the aerotab and start doing the procedure, in between if you get pain or if you inflict pain for the patient, then you will lose the cooperation. It has happened many times for me. So in between, you might live. Before, for the entire procedure, the child might be cooperative. Even for the local anesthesia, the child might be cooperative. But for air rotor, once I have used the air rotor, the child become uncooperative because of pain. So I need to manage that particular pain. And sometimes I had a case where I couldn't do the procedure because of the pain. He was cooperative for all the local anesthesia, but he is not cooperative for air rotor. How much of our convince also, I was not able to use aerot on that particular case. So I have completely failed in that particular case. So before using aerot, make sure that the pain has been completely relieved or pain has been uh, completely um, uh, taken care of. And then only you're supposed to go and expose the pulp chamber or do any uh, pulpal therapy for this case. That is especially careful when you're managing an young permanent molar. And in the tooth, we don't have much difficulties. We can easily get the anesthesia. So what all treatment modalities are there? So it can be classified into two types, that is vital pulp therapy and non-vital pulp therapy. Vital, as we all know, that is indirect pulp capping, direct pulp capping. We have some modifications in pulpotomy, that is miniature pulpotomy, partial pulpotomy, pulpotomy, and deep pulpotomy, and non-vital, we have apexification and revascularization. Coming on to each one, that is starting with our uh, indirect pulp capping. Before that, uh, we have another treatment modality that is uh, root and recession was there before. That is apisectomy and then correcting the uh, open apex. But nowadays, it's not indicated. Why? Because we don't want to push the child, a seven or eight year old child for a surgical procedure one thing. And again, the apical part or the root part of the fear, root is very thin. So that can uh, fracture while your procedure. And even if you do a proper treatment also, the future of that particular tooth also will be compromised. So we can, we have other treatment modalities are there. So that can, without surgery, we can uh, get a proper apical seal. So this particular surgical procedure nowadays, it is, completely, uh, what is that, abandoned or not uh, used. Even in the endodontist also, even if a cyst also is there, they are not following uh, surgical endodontics, rather than they are going for the non-surgical endodontics. A big cyst can also be treated by uh, non-surgical endodontics and you can manage it. So same way here also, we can manage the end permanent tooth by non-surgical method. I have mentioned different treatment protocols, so different treatment procedures for me, starting from uh, indirect pulp capping, direct pulp capping, pulpotomy, and different types of pulpotomy, apexification, and revascularization. So which procedure we have to follow? That mainly depends upon our clinical examination and the history of the patient. That's very important in the case of any permanent tooth. Because even if there is a minute chance to maintain the vitality of the pulp, we have to maintain it. So for that, you need to enquire or you need to probe into the history, all the aspects, all the possible questions to get an answer whether it is an irreversible pulpitis or irreversible pulpitis. Very common question what we used to ask in a uh, clinical, uh, this one is that whether the pain is there at the night time or not. Parent will say that yes, pain was there at the night thing 
before sleeping he or she had a pain so immediately we'll assume that the child is having an irreversible pulpitis and our treatment modalities will be complete extirpation of the pulp and then going for apexification so once you open up you can see that there will be vital pulp tissue inside that so we might go wrong in such instances so your clinical examination should be very important that night pain can be because of that after having the dinner sometimes the child might have a habit of taking a chocolate or a laddu or jalebi or something sweet he might be taking so that might be stuck inside the cavity and once it is stuck inside the cavity what happens is that when the child goes to sleep because of the acidic nature of that particular um, sugary food there will be pain will be there and that will be misinterpreted as irreversible pulpitis so you need to ask in detail about the history what type of pain and if at all the patient the classical symptom of irreversible pulpitis is that if the child wakes up in between the sleep that is waking pain if the uh, parent says that in between at the 2 o'clock in the morning the child wake up and started crying saying that severe pain and it has subsided after taking some medication or it was there till up to the morning early in the morning only she, she slept or he slept then that indicates that it is a reversible pulpitis otherwise we need to think that there is some hope that some vitality of the tooth is still remaining so you need to find out clinical examination and the history very properly to rule out whether it is reversible or irreversible pulpitis and our intention is to if there is very little pulp tissue vital pulp tissue is there we have to preserve that for the root and formation and the status of the pulp again is very important that is whether as i mentioned before irreversibly damaged or reversibly damaged if at all irreversibly damaged till up to what extent whether it is only a little bit of the coronal pulp or half the coronal pulp or entire coronal pulp or two third of the root portion of the pulp or if there is any root is vital or anything like that you need to know about the status of the pulp also so that also we need to check it then another one adjoint what you need to use is radiographic examination your radiograph intraoral periapical radiograph with good apical uh, visibility that is very important because when you take a radiograph of maxillary especially an young permanent tooth seven or eight year old child it will be very difficult to place the film uh your film uh, in the um, uh, palatal area because the child will have a gagging sensation the big film sometimes uh will be extending till up to the throat area causing difficulty and if you hold it or if you ask the parent to hold it then again it will be it will be better to take with a uh, x-ray holder that's the most ideal one and if you use it the x-ray holder also sometimes you may not get a proper picture and sometimes as a compromise you might use a smaller film then also you may not get an apex so i have a case where you can see that this particular radiograph you can see both the mesial and the distal root i can see clearly but the apical or, or the uh, palatal root i cannot see properly the mesial and distal root has been completely closed and if i plan a treatment in such a way that i'll go for root canal treatment for this particular case because the pulp is irreversibly damaged i'll go for a root canal treatment then i might go wrong because you can see over here the palatal root is wide open so the mesial and the distal root is completely closed but the palatal root is wide open so in the pre operative radiograph i didn't get the apex properly so you need to get a proper radiograph with the peri apex especially on an young permanent tooth sometimes we might be little lazy because in this particular case i was a little lazy about uh, taking one more radiograph so without that i have started my procedure and once i have started mesial and distal root has been completed but the palatal root is wide open where i need to go for an apexification procedure later and normally what you can see is that so normally what you can see is that the palatal root of the maxillary tooth will take more time for the closure and the distal root of the mandibular also will take more time for the apical closure if the mesiobuccal and the mesio uh, mesiobuccal and the distobuccal root is completely closed it will take some more time for the palatal root to completely close likewise if the mesial root of the ma mandibular teeth is been closed means your mesiobuccal and mesiobuccal canal mesiolingual canal has been closed it will take some more time for the distal canal 
if this tubercle and this lingual canals are there or if this is a c-shaped canal also it will take some more time for the complete closure so we need to get a good radiograph that affects both the palatal and the distal root. so the radiograph is also very important and many times what you can see that we'll um, uh, i have seen that um, the clinicians explain the radiolucency involving the pulp that cannot be uh, always true because that depends upon the angulation if you change the angulation you can see that the radiolucency will be into the pulp and and a different angulation we can see a thin layer of dentin in btv so with the radiograph we cannot assess whether the pulp is involved or not it's only a shadow you cannot completely uh, rely upon that for the pulpal involvement and again if a thin layer of dentin is there in btv in the um, uh, radiolucency that is a shadow uh, caused by the caries and the shadow which is radiolucency between the pulp there is a radio opacity is a thin layer of radio piece is there also they can be the pulp might be irreversibly damaged because through that thin dentinal wall thin dentinal tubules microorganism might have penetrated in the pulp and there can be pulpal inflammation so we may go wrong also in such a so you need to rely upon the clinical status and clinical then the history of the patient and the status of the pulp rather than that of the radiograph and in the radiograph if you want to see or if you want to appreciate the pulpal involvement more than 30 percentage of the bone structure or the calcified structure has to be resolved then only we can see that so we cannot completely rely upon on the radiograph again coming on to the apex in the radiograph what you can uh, see is that sometimes because of open apex we might get confused that it is because of the lesion periapical lesion so you need to clearly uh, differentiate whether it is a periapical lesion or it is because of the wide open apex you need to clearly differentiate these two things and then you have to go for your uh, treatment modality or which treatment you need to so before going on to the treatment uh, procedure or which procedure you are going to follow you need to clearly look upon the clinical examination the history of the patient then you need to find out the status of the pulp then finally the radiograph also with all these procedure you can then go for which treatment option you have or which treatment i would go for this particular case so before going into my treatment option i have a case where uh, i would say that we should respect the pulp if you respect the pulp pulp will uh, give you the proper response to you so this was a case that is seven year old boy reported with a trauma of anterior tooth you can see in this radiograph the root is not formed oh it is in the sweck stage 1 that is less than half of the root oh uh, less than that only the crown portion is there and because of the trauma the tooth is has a grade 3 mobility and tooth is attached onto the gingiva there is no other attachment at all and we can see the adjacent tooth which is not erupted all the deciduous tooth on one side which is almost on the verge of exfoliation so all the teeth and the teeth are mobile along with that the newly erupted central incisive was also mobile and the child at 7 year of age immediately after trauma child was not cooperative for any even for the examination also crying and bleeding from that area i was not able to examine properly and with great difficulty this radiograph has been taken so with all this difficulty i have explained the parent that we have two options are there either we can extract this particular tooth or else with very less chance of retaining this tooth in the oral cavity you can uh, do a splinting that also if the patient cooperate i can do it so that was the treatment option given to the parent and while giving the treatment option i had because since it was an uh, permanent tooth i had given that se second option that is splinting that particular tooth otherwise i would not not opted for that uh, i have no hope at all that this particular tooth will stay in the oral cavity i have splinted it and uh, what has happened is that within 3 days uh, the splint has been dislodged again i was not there in that particular i was doing a consultation in that particular clinic so i was not there in that clinic the dentist over there has done a second splinting so at that time he was little more cooperative and the bleeding uh, such uh, difficulties was not there so he could, he was able to do a better splinting 
than the first one. And that splinting, what you can see is that I was not used any anterior tooth. The splinting was taken that abutment tooth was either side canine and first density smaller was taken as an abutment. So that long span splinting has been done. And this is after one month. When I see that case, still the child, that area is a little bit inflamed, but comparatively, he was okay. So I've taken a radiograph at that particular time and asked them to wait for that particular splint for a longer time. And this was the patient when he came for three months. After three months re uh, review, again, the permanent tooth has not erupted into the oral cavity. The adjacent primary tooth are still present over there. Splinting is still there. And the root, we can see little more root formation has happened. Or little more root, apical root formation has happened, which has given a hope that this tooth might stay into the oral cavity. And later, I see this patient after one and a half years. Because patient didn't report to me after that. Because every time when the splint gets the splint get dislodged, we are re-splinting it. And for that, we are charging it also. So the patient was a uh, little, uh, what is, uh, smart enough. So after when the splint, splint dislodged, they didn't report. Because the tooth was firm in the oral cavity. And you can see here, the composite which I placed here for splinting is still over there. But the root portion, you can see that it has been developed. It was not comparable with that of the adjacent tooth, but still what you can see that it is much more smaller, but the apical constriction, it is happening over there. And this particular incident, that is at eight and a half years, I have removed the composite and kept under review. And later, by nine years of age, what I can notice over here is that still the root is complete. So if I would have extracted this particular tooth, I would have done a crime on the species. So if I have respected that pulp, this is the way what you can see over here, that the reparative capacity of the pulp is very high because of the wide open apex, abundant blood supply, high cellularity, vascularity, those sort of things. So the reparative capacity is very high. So we should keep in mind that when you're managing an impermanent tooth, try to maintain the vitality or be minimally invasive as possible. How much minimally invasive possible we need to. If there is any hope that any vital tissue is remaining, we have to maintain it. So that will help in the continued root formation, apical closure, and the longevity of that particular tooth. So that should be our aim. And my entire presentation is based on this particular criteria, that is to maintain the vitality as much as possible. So with that, I'll go to the first treatment option, that is indirect pulp capping. So as we all know that if there is any remaining dentin which is there, we have to retain that particular dentin. Over that, we can place some uh, material that will help in the uh, reparative capacity of the pulp, and thereby it will repair. So the area where we might go wrong is, normally what we can see is that uh, I had given an um, uh, indirect pulp capping. It failed. Normally, what we can see from the clinician's point of view is that mainly because of the lack of hermetic seal. Normally, what you can see is that IPC is done with a calcium hydroxide uh, lining or that a temporary filling will be given. A syngoxygenol temporary filling will be given. So that may not stay in the oral cavity. Within a few days, there will be micro leakage will be there and your treatment will be failed. So if you are giving an indirect pulp capping, if it is an anterior tooth or a posterior tooth, whichever tooth it be, a hermetic seal or a proper seal is very important. To get a hermetic seal, what you need to do is that clean the margins of the cavity. You, are not, you don't need to touch the floor of the pulp chamber or close to the pulp chamber. If you feel that further excavation will expose the pulp, leave the pulp, whether it is infective or affective or whatever it may be, leave the pulp. Try to retain that pulp over there. Even if it is infected also, you try to retain it. And the sides of the cavity, you clean it. And then get a hermetic seal. And the material what you can use is that either MTA, biodentin, calcium hydroxide. Any of these three materials can be used. Calcium hydroxide, very common a material. Uh, uh, you can use it. MTA and biodentin, an excellent materials which we can use it, only the cost is a factor, but this will give you a very good result in the case of young permanent tooth. 
and the hermetic seal is very important in this case. The glass enema has to be given and this glass enema has to bond onto the surface so that the margins of the cavity should be properly cleansed. And yes. And finally, if it is a multi-surface lesion, the stainless steel crown has to be given. So you can see in this particular picture here, it's a multi-surface lesion. So if we give a indirect pearl capping, and over this, if you give a crown, or over this, if you give a glass enema restoration, or a composite restoration, what happens is that over a period of time, because the margins of the tooth are not uh, that great, or it is hypomineralized, there can be breakage will be there, there can be again micro leakage, leading to secondary caries uh, and thereby failure of the treatment. So if we give a crown on that particular tool, that will protect it and that will help in the root formation. So our intention should be a proper seal with a biocompatible material like calcium hydroxide, biodentin, MTA, and over that a tight seal, hermetic seal, either with glass enema composite, if that is not possible, if a crown, crown has to be given. This is a modification, what I have. So this particular piece, uh, case reported to the department with all the signs of irreversible pulpitis. Night pain was there. And uh, what you can say, all the signs of irreversible pulpitis was there. So once we took a radiograph, what we could say that the apex is not completely formed, especially the distal part of the tooth is not completely formed. So we have planned for an indirect pulp capping on this case. Ideally, this would have gone for a uh, apexification procedure. So since there are articles saying that irreversible pulpitis can be managed with the help of newer materials, we can manage it. We have tried this in our department. I think this case was Amanda's case, Dr. Amanda's case. And here, uh, what has been done is that MT has been placed over the tooth before we have not exposed the um, pulp chamber. It has been after removing the gross cadis lesion uh, on the uh, flow, MT has been placed and over that a glass cinema cement has been given immediately. And in this radiograph also, you can see that there is condensing osteitis at the apex of the tooth. That indicates that the root also has been inflamed, that the tooth is irreversibly damaged. But still, this case, there is no post-operative pain. Till date, there is no post-operative pain. We had given a stainless steel crown for this patient also. We had uh, recalled for this, uh, this patient for review, but because of the corona, they said they are not coming right now. But the patient is completely asymptomatic. So even if, so my point over here is that even if there is chance or if irreversible pulpitis case is there, you can opt for uh, indirect pulp capping, can be given in such condition, and try for the normal root closure. If at all, if it fails, you have the options of apexification. You have further options are there wide open for you, rather than completely extirpating the pulp and doing an apexification procedure. So these are the few articles which are available. That is biodendin partial pulpotomy of an young permanent molar with signs and symptoms symptoms indicative of irreversible pulpitis and periapical lesion, a five-year follow-up. So in this particular case, they have uh, clearly reported that the root apex has been completely formed and the tooth is completely asymptomatic. They haven't gone for a root canal treatment. And this is International Enteronic Journal, Mineral Trioxid Aggregate Pulpotomy for a permanent molar with a clinical signs indicative of irreversible pulpitis, a preliminary study. And the treatment outcome of mineral trioxide aggregate Pulpotomy in vital uh, permanent teeth with caries pulpal exposure, the retrospective study. In all these cases, irreversible pulpitis cases, they have tried with MT and biodentin, they have done the capping and they would be able to get the uh, apical root closure or remaining dentin can be uh, formed or apical closure can be obtained. So if at all there is a very minute chance of maintaining the pulp vitality, we have to do that. So that is about the indirect pulp capping. Then coming to the direct pulp capping, if there is any pulpal exposure. This normally we will encounter in the case of an anterior tooth. Immediately after trauma, the patient reports with a pulpal exposure, we can go for a direct pulp capping. Cavious exposure rarely 
uh, it has been indicated, but still we can go for direct pulp capping in the cages exposure also. So we have other options also, but normally the direct pulp capping will use it in the case of uh, an anterior tooth. And the indication as the textbook says that less than five millimeter of exposure and the hemorrhage, which can be easily controlled and area should be uncontaminated and the, the tooth should be asymptomatic and it should be within 24 hours of exposure, within 24 hours. So if the patient reports within 24 hours, he can go for a direct pulp cap in the situation that is ang permanent so that the remaining pulp can be made white. So what are materials can be used? Our calcium hydroxide, the same material can be used for indirect pulp capping. This is the calcium hydroxide powder, which has been mixed with the saline and then you can use it or with the distilled water. Even though this material is an age old material, even the literature says that the reparative dentin, which is formed by powder and liquid or with the aqueous mix is much more better than that of the other types of material. That is your dical or your light cure glass and light cure um, uh, calcium hydroxide cement. So this can be used, but only disadvantage is that you cannot retain in a particular area. If you mix it, that mix will keep on, uh, that will, uh, you cannot get a consistency, a proper mix to play with. If you have a deep cavity where you can place it, you can use this. Otherwise it will be difficult. It will be very difficult to place on the axial wall and it will be very difficult to place on an anterior exposure where you have got a, a class three fracture, playlist class three fracture. You cannot place this particular material over there. It will be difficult. Like all, we are uh, using and uh, very commonly used material. Again, this material also, once you mix it, it will become, uh, it will set hard. And if you place it over that particular area, it might get dislodged easily. The retention of this material is comparatively less. And over this, you cannot place a composite restoration also. After placing the dical, you might need to use a glass cinema a lining over that, over the dentin, and then over that, you can place a composite restoration. And placing it on the axial wall also, it will be difficult with dicap. So we have an, another material that is Calcimol LP by Voco company. This is a light cured glass and uh, calcium hydroxide cement. So which is available in the syringe type, which you can precisely place on your exposure. Normally, if you have a class three fracture, you might have uh, heard in your uh, find your uh, theory class that what you can do is that you can place calcium hydroxide on the exposed site and over that, uh, glass cinema cement and over that composite. It's easy to say, but practically to place all these three materials into a small tooth would be very difficult because to uh, confine your filling onto the uh, exposed pulp of 0.5 millimeter, then another one, uh, one millimeter of dentin which has been covered by your glass cinema cement, then the remaining enamel to be used for your composite. It's difficult. So if you use calcium or LP, you can pinpoint this particular agent to that exposed pulp. But again, there is a controversy about this material. This cannot be used on an exposed pulp. It's not that great when compared to that of your other material, that is dicarb or other material, calcium hydroxide paste. This material is not that good, but still, if it is close to the pulp or just involving the pulp, you can go for this option also. And especially on the axial wall of your young permanent molar, if you want to keep it, you can place this material. And over that we have uh, light cube glass enamel is there. That is um, anoseal LC. That is again a Poco company. That also is available in a syringe system. So you can place it exactly on the dentin and thereby you can uh, confine it to the dentin. And then over that you can give a composite restoration. Then the pro-root MTA, the best material and your biodentin. The now the presently available, the most only thing the expense is a little bit higher. The advantage of biodentin is that you can get a creamy mix that can be placed. The disadvantage of your pro-root MTA is that once you mix, either it will be grainy or it will be too much watery. So it will be difficult to place it. Its manipulation is difficult, but your biodentin, the manipulation is excellent. Only thing is that the cost phase is a little bit costlier than that of the biodentin. And the most important thing is that staining of the tooth, that I'll come to it later about the staining of the tooth. So biodentin can also be used as a direct care. 
So if you have an option of a young permanent tooth with an exposed pulp, your first option, I would say that biodentin, if that is not available, NTA, or if that is not available, calcium hydroxy. So this should be your choice. And biodentin is the most ideal material and thereby we can get a proper healing of the pulp. Then coming to the next stage, that is our pulpotomy. That is pulpotomy as a definition by Finn, that is complete removal of the coronal pulp. It can be classified according to the amount of pulp tissue involved and the type of medicaments you can use. According to the amount of pulp tissue involved, we have cervical pulpotomy or the conventional pulpotomy. As the definition indicates, that is complete removal of the coronal pulp and placement of a suitable medicament over the pulp. That is your cervical pulpotomy. We have a little more conservative one, that is Shrek pulpotomy or partial pulpotomy. That is little bit of pulp tissue only is removed, that is two millimeter of pulp tissue is only removed, and then we can place any material, either biodentin, cal uh, MTA, calcium hydroxide, or calcium enriched cement, calcium silicate cement, or what may be, material can be placed, that is partial pulpotomy. We have one more modification in that, that is miniature pulpotomy. That is, this is more conservative. That is partial pulpotomy or two millimeter. Then we have little more conservative one, that is miniature pulpotomy can be done. So the intention is that as conservative as possible, we have to do. So if miracle capping is possible, go for that. If that is not possible, go for miniature pulpotomy. If miniature pulpotomy has not an option for you, go for partial pulpotomy. If partial pulpotomy is not an option for you, go for cervical pulpotomy. If again, cervical pulpotomy. So here you can see that this picture, little bit of the pulp has been removed and the calcium hydroxide has been placed. That is a partial pulpotomy. If this is a failure or if you cannot control or if you cannot, can, you cannot control a bleeding or you don't see that a uh, pulp tissue has been a uh, uh, good pulp tissue you haven't uh, seen in this particular area. We have gone for a conventional pulpotomy. That is gone till up to the coronal portion and then you are. After removing the coronal pulp also, you are not able to get a proper bleeding or you cannot control the bleeding. You still feel that the pulp is uh, inflamed. We have another option, the pulpotomy. So our intention is that this particular pulp, which is vital, has been maintained over there. So that will help the Herdwig's epithelial root sheath for continued dentin deposition and thereby root and formation and remaining dentin will be sufficient. And at times you, you don't need for your root canal treatment. So you can see that how conservative we have been. That is starting from miniature, partial pulpotomy, cervical pulpotomy, and deep pulpotomy. And if all these fails, then we can go for your uh, uh, apexification procedure. And what are medicaments, what can be used? Calcium hydroxide, MTA, biodentin. So the pulpotomies, we, what we have is miniature, partial, cervical, and deep pulpotomies. So this is the article for the miniature pulpotomy. That is, little bit of the pulp tissue has been removed. Uh, I'll show you the cases where you might require to remove little bit of the pulp tissue because direct pulp capping may not be possible. We have seen a pulpal exposure. Or a pulpal exposure has been seen, and it is 0.5 millimeter only of size or one millimeter of size, whether we can go for a direct pulp capping. But what you need to do is little bit of pulp tissue has to be removed. Only then only you can place because in an anterior teeth, if you place a direct root capping, you have a calcium hydroxide or whatever, you have an MTA or you have a biodegrade. Over that, if you place a reattachment, it will be difficult for you to reattach that particular tooth. Or else you need to do some modification of the fragment and then you have to place it. So in such instances, if you go for a miniature pulpotomy, that will be beneficial. 
so that the little bit of the pulp tissue has been removed. You prepare a cater uh, or you prepare a space for there for your material to a biocompatible material to be placed, and then you can do the restriction. So that is the advantage of your miniature pulpotomy, and it is a conservative one also. Then your streck pulpotomy. According to the streck, what he has mentioned is that two mm of exposure, and that has to be within. 72 hours. That is the ideal uh, situation for your pulpotomy. But according to the new revisited uh, by uh, Binstein, what you can see is that in up to nine days, you can go for your pulpotomy. Before your pulpotomy was still up to 72 hours. That is still up to three days. Only till up to three days, you can go for your conventional or cervical pulpotomy. But according to the new guidelines, you can remove the pulp tissue till up to four millimeter, and you can go till up to nine days. If the patient reports within the nine days, also you can go for the pulpotomy. And another criteria is that it should be an open apex because the reparative capacity will be very high on this open apex because of the abandoned wealth. So we our options are now wide open that we can go for a pulpotomy for a little extended time so that we can maintain the remaining pulp vital that will help for the normal root push. So apical, it was two millimeter before, now it has extended till up to four millimeter. That is a considerable amount of pulp, four millimeter is considerable amount of pulp, we can expose it. And then again, till up to nine days also, we can wait. it. So, so that is about the conventional or sweat pulp water. So this is a picture where we have gone for a yeah, uh, spec pulpotomy. It has not reached till up to uh, this one. A little bit considerable amount of the pulp has been placed. But one disadvantage, what you can see over here, is that discoloration. Why? Because it has been a mineral trioxide aggregate has been used. So whenever we are planning for a pulpotomy on an N permanent tooth and that tooth on an anterior tooth, it will be always better to use biodent rather than MTA. Whether it is gray MTA, white MTA, water MTA, it will discolor. Biodent, the discoloration will be comparatively less, or else you can go for a neo MTA also, that will be much more better. But biodent is the best, what you can go for that. So if it is for the anterior teeth, it will be better, go for biodent. If it is for the molar, you can go for the MTA and other material, gray MTA or white MTA, because cost, you can reduce the cost. But here, you should not compromise for the cost because aesthetics is important in the anterior teeth. In some conditions, if the tooth is, uh, suppose if you're going for a pulpotomy on a class four fracture where enamel has, or there is no crown fracture, only the tooth has become, uh, oh, sorry. If you're going for a pulpotomy procedure uh, on an anterior tooth without a crown fracture, uh, uh, without uh, what you can see, if you're going for a, uh, for example, reattachment procedure, later you're not going for a crown placement, you should opt for biodentin rather than MTA because this can be the possible complication you can get. This discoloration you cannot get rid of and also you can get rid of this discoloration by uh, bonding agent but that is again difficult but this is a uh, usual complication you can get if you're using MTA for anterior teeth pulp. Biodentin or neo MTA is another choice, but better than neo MTA, biodentin is the best choice because you can get a creamy mix of biodentin and thereby you can get. So, this is a clinical case where you can see on 2 1, there is a pinpoint exposure was there, and that has been uh, given by uh, protected with the dietal. And over the dichal glass cinema was been placed, and then the composite filling has been done. So the, thereby, we have not removed the pulp chamber, or as conservative as possible, it has been managed. And the continued root formation, we can get it in this particular case. And another condition where we can see considerable amount of pulp has been involved. Here it will be better, we'll go for a partial pulpotomy. And in this case, what the parent has done is that 
his fractured fragment the child has brought along with the uh, along with the child the fractured fragment also is there many a times what happens is that whenever the patient gives you a call uh, that my tooth uh, we get a call in the office in the dental office saying that tooth has fractured shall i get an appointment so immediately the first question what you need to ask is that whether you have the fragment with you if you have the fragment get the fragment and then place it in a solution either a saline solution or water or even milk anything you put it back and bring to the clinic so that we can reattach that particular fragment many times what you can see is that if a fragment is there they will throw it out and there are instances the parent has gone back it has happened to the school and the parent has gone back to the school and retrieved that fragment it was in the um, playground from the playground the fragment has been retrieved and we have reimplanted it so the advantage of reimplanting it is that aesthetics will be excellent and the retention also if you are properly managed it have the retention more than that of a composite restoration if you build a composite over here the chance of fracture will be much more than placing a properly treated fragment so this case has been managed by a pulpotomy procedure dical has been placed and here as i have mentioned before while reattaching what happens is that you need to manipulate the fragment then only we can overcome that uh, protruded calcium hydroxide a glass enamel which is placed over there so if you do a pulpotomy or miniature pulpotomy you can remove little bit of pulp tissue over there you can confine your calcium hydroxide or biotin or whatever it may be inside that defect and this area you can get it free for your reattachment and you can reattach the fat so after placing the glass enema lining the fragment has been modified etching has to be done and after etching both the fragment and the uh, tooth also has been completely etched and holding of this fragment is very difficult so you need to have a sticky wax with you so many times when you can see that when you ask for the sticky wax it may not be there so you have to keep the sticky wax in your uh, emergency kit so that you can use that sticky wax and then hold it because if you uh, hold it with your hand what happens is that when you place it over the tooth it might fall off it might fall down onto the floor or it might fall into the oral cavity and it will get contaminated again you might need to so to secure that it will be always better to hold with the help of a sticky wax so that we can easily manipulate this particular fragment so the etching of the fragment is been done both the areas have been etched and the both the areas bonding agent has to be applied and after applying the bonding agent you need to air thin it both the areas that is onto the tooth surface and onto the uh, uh, reattached uh, onto the uh, crown fragment that has to be air thin but never cure it if you cure it what happens is that that a layer will be formed over there and further when you reattach the tooth there will be slight defect will be there you cannot get a proper reattachment over there there will be a small defect in between the reattached fragment and your original tooth so if you don't do that you can easily place the fragment over there even if you can use a flowable composite after uh, air thinning it you can use a flowable composite and then place it over the tooth and then see the position proper position and then we can cure it after placing securing it properly and then you can cure it so this will be the final result so this was the initially you can see that the overlapping what you see over here the same overlapping we can get it with your fragment if you do a composite restoration this overlapping will be difficult only an expert hands we can get this overlapping this even if you are not that expert also you can get proper fragment reattachment and the aesthetics also has been maintained you can see that the color matching the contour everything has been perfect so that is the advantage of reattaching the fragment so if a fractured fragment is available then you have to replacement you should try replacing that fragment even it is fragmented in a two piece also you can attach you can attach the two piece together and then you can try that 
If it is multiple pleases, then definitely you have to go for other fragment options. But if it is available in a single fragment, definitely. So your first question is that whether the fragment is available or not. If you discard the fragment, that is a grave mistake what you're doing. So never discard the fragment, try to reattach. After placing it and then curing it, what you can do is that you can then go for your, uh, uh, what you can, uh, uh, reinforcing this by giving a groove on the, uh, um, above the fracture and the below the fracture with a round bar, and then you can flow the composite over that so that it will uh, form a layer over that that will prevent for the fracture, the shearing force also that will prevent. And that can be done on the lingual aspect also. There are other options of managing the uh, fragments uh, by beveling the margins, you can improve the surface area. But once you do the beveling, what happens is that reattachment will be difficult. You may not be able to uh, reattach properly in the correct position. So uh, I personally feel that beveling will be a, a difficult one clinically to reattach, but rather after placing it, you can put a groove both on the uh, apical area and also on the incisal area, and then you can place a composite restoration over that, thereby you can uh, retain it. So by giving a groove, you can uh, place the composite and then it can hold there both on the buckle and on the palatal aspect, thereby you can reinforce the crown and then retain it. This is another case of reattachment. This tooth has been fractured. So that has been, uh, composite restoration has been done on this area and the other area, a fragment has been reattached. So always it will be better to reattach the fragment rather than giving a composite restoration. So this is a picture where the pulpal exposure and reattached, you can see that little bit of fragment is broken, but still it is natural. The contour, everything has been there. And the aesthetics can be immediately obtained. That is once the child leaves from the office, he'll be having his tooth in the oral cavity. That is psychologically beneficial for both for the child and for the parent, rather than having a composite or an artificial illustration in the oral cavity. So the apexification, what you can get is that the biodentin, you can see the root closure. That is normal root closure, you can get it. With a vital pulp tissue. Here it was a funnel shape. Now it is getting constricted. And as we go on, it will take around one to one and a half years or two years for the complete root closure. Now when compared to the adjacent tooth, this might take a little more extra time sometimes. When you have exogenesis. Is sometimes it may take an extra time or sometimes it will be accelerated, depends upon the tooth. So you need to wait for that and complete root closure. And again, we will have a question. Once the apex is closed, whether should be re enter whether we need to do a root canal treatment or not. We have retained the vitality of the pulp. So if that vitality is retained, that is sufficient enough, we can give a crown for this particular case. We can give a crown, or if you want to give a post or something like that, you can go for a root canal treatment. Otherwise, if you're not planning for a post, without that, if you are, can, if you are able to get a crown for this particular case, then you don't need to re-enter, or you don't need to completely extirpate the pulp. So when we should re-enter? when there is pulp canal obliteration. Or in this particular case, what you can see is that you cannot see any root canal. If there is obliteration of the pulp canal, then, or if you see that the root canal has been obliterated, then we have to go for complete expression of the pulp. Because later it will be difficult for you to negotiate the canal. Otherwise, you don't need to uh, do a re-entry. So how can you prevent this uh, pulp canal obliteration? That is by when you're placing the calcium hydroxide or when you're placing the biodentin or when you're placing the MPA onto the pulp chamber, the preparatory dentin formation is by an inflammation. And that inflammation, if it is not controlled because of the inflammation, that will cause the dentin formation. And that dentin formation will be continued and that dentin formation is not controlled, and that is where you can get a pulp canal obliteration. So if we can control that inflammation, 
we can prevent this vulcanal obliteration. So that inflammation can be controlled by when you're placing the calcium hydroxide or biodendin or MDA, whatever material you're using. The biodendin and MDA may not cause this much of uh, inflammation, but calcium hydroxide will because of the high pH, it will. But MDA and biodendin, which is much more biocompatible, but still, when you're placing on the exposed pulp, you have to just place it on the exposed pulp. Do not apply pressure. Once you apply pressure, you are uh, pushing that material into the pulp chamber, causing inflammation into the pulp chamber, leading that inflammation much more deeper. And that inflammation, which may not be controlled, causing your uh, pulp canal obliteration. What we require is a dentin bridge formation over there, where you are placed. Just immediately beneath your placement. For that, you should not apply any pressure over the uh, placed calcium hydroxide. You just place the calcium hydroxide over there, give a glass enamel base, and then over that, you can give your composite or whatever restoration, permanent restoration you can give it. And then review the patient. If there is complete root and formation, well and good, you can go for your crown if it all required. If crown is not required, you can again keep the patient under review every six months, one year, and every two years. And whenever you see there is a pulp canal obliteration or anything like that, at that time you can intervene. So you have ample time. So you are as conservative as possible. So once these all procedures are not possible, then we may need to go for apexification. All these things have failed, or all these all these procedures are not possible for us. Then for the apical closure, we need to induce the apical closure. So what are materials are there? Our conventional materials, that is injecting our white apex, our metapex into the canal system or calcium hydroxide powder. This we used to do when you are doing our post-graduation. We don't have that metapex or white apex at that time. We used to mix it with the saline and then push it into the canal. Or else the powder with the um, amalgam carrier, we used to push it into the uh, orifice and with the uh, condenser, we used to uh, plug a finger plugger, uh, hand plugger, we used to condense it into the apical area. So, but still, this material is considered the best material when compared to white apex or uh, metapex. Why? Because when it is mixed with the water content, the reparated or the dentin formation will be much more faster and the effect also will be, the quality also will be much more better than this material. But the time consumed by using this material for apexification will be more. So before uh, using this material, let me just explain about the procedure. That is an apexification procedure. We'll just open up the pulp chamber. And after opening up the pulp chamber, irrigate it thoroughly with your sodium hypochlorate, uh, chlorexidine, or whatever irrigant, EDTA, whatever irrigant you are using, you can irrigate it thoroughly. And then you can give a dressing. A calcium hydroxide dressing can be given to the patient so that if there is any acute symptoms, everything will subside. And once those are symptoms, everything has been subsided, then you can go for your apexification procedure. That is injecting or placing calcium hydroxide into the orifice. So that can be done. So injecting the calcium hydroxide, we can use either your metapex or white apex. The advantage of using white apex is that the tip of the white apex is very uh, handy. That it can go, especially if you're going for a uh, apexification of a mandibular or maxillary um, mesiobuccal or distobuccal or uh, mandibular mesiobuccal or mesiobuccal root, which will be narrower. So if you use metapex on such cases, your metapex won't reach till up to the apex because the flow property of the metapex won't be that great. So in that case, the metapex won't reach till up to the apex. It might be in between, and later you'll get some uh, calcification of those areas. So in such cases, that is on the mesiobuccal and mesiolingual roots, you can use white apex. And the distal root, which is wide enough, you can use metapex because because the wider canal, you can use metapex. If you think about the 
cost factor because white apex one syringe costs you around three thousand rupees. Meta apex two syringes will cost you around thousand four hundred rupees. You'll get it. So you can see the cost difference. But you can use this material judiciously. That is for the mesovocal narrow roots. You can if the new root is narrower curve, you can go for your white apex. Otherwise, meta. Uh, uh, I, am, uh, I have used this iodotin a newer material which has a similar tip like that of the white apex. So the advantage of this is that this flow property is much more better than the meta apex. So it can be uh, injected till up to the peri apex. So that can be used if you are planning for an apexification. And if you are single visit, visit apexification with your pro root MTA. So these are the cases uh, which has been done because now we have uh, gone for a newer treatment modalities. So these are the old radiograph. Still we are going for your apexification with the calcium hydroxide uh, in certain cases. But uh, I'll show you the, uh, some of the um, photographs of a uh, few cases. You can see that you open apex. A work length has to be taken for that. Why? Because suppose if you are injecting your material periapically, there are chances that you might inject the material periapically. So if you inject the material periapically, there won't be any issue at all. But the material will get resolved within three months of time. But that can damage the Hertwig's epithelial root sheet. The calcium hydroxide, what you're using, has got very high pH. And that is very irritant. And you can see that once it goes to the periapical area, the patient will have some postoperative pain. Or immediately, even if under local anesthesia, sometimes you can see that patient will wing his eyes once it reaches the periapical area. Yeah, when you are practicing it, you might see that. So that indicates that the material has reached in the periapical area. You have to be careful. So if it reaches the periapical area, there won't be any issue at all. It will get resolved within three months. But what I have seen is that the apical end will get a calcitic barrier rather than normal apical closure. So if you confine the material just short of the apex, or if you, uh, if you won't reach till up to the apex, then there are chances of a continued root and formation because you have not damaged the herd big material. If you're pushing material periapically, there can be chances because calcium hydroxide is not that uh, uh, biocompatible uh, like other materials. So that can damage the herbic epithelial root. So that is the importance of taking a radiograph and keeping it short. And at the same time, it, sh it should not be very short also. If you go till up to the middle third of the tooth and uh, uh, leave it, there can be calcification of this area. So I have cases I'll show you uh, in the coming slide. So a radiograph has to be taken and the material has to be extruded. Here what I can, can see is that little bit of the material has been extruded out. So you have to uh, prevent it from extruding. And a cotton pellet has to be placed so that you can re-enter in the subsequent appointment. And over that, glass enema and a hermetic seal has to be obtained. And if possible, if the, in this particular case, what you can see is that only this part of the tooth is only remaining. It will be better if we place a stainless steel crown over this it will be better so that the tooth will be intact and the apexification process will continue. I can show you certain failure cases also because of the lack of um, uh, coronal seal. So the coronal seal is very important. So once you do this particular procedure, you need to recall the patient every three months to see the coronal seal and recall every six months. You need to take a radiograph also to see whether there is progress in the apical uh, or root and closure. So every three months you need to record and every six months you need to take a radiograph. And it will take in a, uh, around one to one and a half years for the complete root and formation. There are different school of thought like uh, you have to remove the calcium hydroxide in between or you can keep the calcium hydroxide itself because the calcium hydroxide is not that, that part of the root enclosure because that uh, 
what is it um environment over there that is aesthetic environment over there is one which is causing the root and corrosion but if you see that the calcium hydroxide is been depleted or the entire calcium hydroxide in the canal sometimes get resorbed in such cases it will be better to refill the calcium hydroxide otherwise you don't need to so if you feel that one or two canals if the calcium hydroxide is been resorbed because of the hollow tube effect you have heard about it because of that it is been resorbed then it is better to refill it again then and the procedure has to be repeated otherwise you don't need to re-enter and this case what you can see is that there is an apical barrier as i mentioned before i have extruded this material periapically so there i got a barrier you can see that here there is a root and closure barrier is not that great here there is an apical constriction is there so if you extrude the material times of barrier formation is more rather than your uh, complete root and ideally what we need is that rather than a barrier formation a dome shaped barrier we would like to have a complete apical constriction will be much more appreciated so within two years we are able to complete the obturation so we could do and again I have a habit of taking after complete obturation uh, before removing or cutting off the gutta percha I'll take a radiograph to see whether any GP point has been extruded out because it's an open apex and we have created a barrier over there sometimes what happens is that your accessory cone might go out and after your complete sealing everything and giving a permanent restoration and if you leave the patient and the recall visit, if you take, this is what has happened for me. That one GP point has been extruding out. So that is my mistake. I would have, while placing the GP point itself, I would have marked it and placed the accessory cone so that the accessory cone should not go beyond my master cone. Because this has been done by a roll call technique, the accessory cone, which I placed over there in the excess space has gone beyond there. So it will be better after, before sealing the cavity, it will be better you take a radiograph and see that we have gone till up to the apex. Here the calcific barrier is there and a dome shaped and an apical obturation you can see that. In this case the remaining dentin is not that great. If you place a uh, crown or a post and post over this, the chance of root fracture will be more rather than if you get a normal apical closure. This is another case in the maxillary molar. Again, you can see that the radiograph apex is not visible because of the faulty placement. Dome shaped barrier has been formed, a calcific barrier. So, once you see the calcific barrier, you can re enter and check with your instrument whether. We can feel that barrier over there. If you feel that barrier over there, and this too, we can see that the mesobuccal and the distobuccal roots, the mesobuccal and the distobuccal root has been completely closed. Only the palatal root is taking an extra time for the root enclosure. And finally, we can obturate it. So here also, we have got a apical barrier. A, it's not an apical constriction, what you get, you got an apical barrier has been obtained. This is another case. So, this case at the time, revascularization is not that prop, uh, popular or it's not there also. So, we have gone for apexification procedure, irreversible pulpitis, all those signs of irreversible pulpitis. We can see that. The placement of the material. So, I have only very little space for the calcium hydroxide to place because only very little root has been formed over there. And mesial and distal side, it has been not extruded. I have tried my maximum to prevent the extrusion. And the radiolucency I have mentioned before, this is not the radiolucency because of the periapical lesion. It is a normal follicle, what you can see on an end permanent tooth. So, this should not be mistaken for the periapical lesion when you take the radiograph. What you can see is that the barrier formation over here. And this barrier formation 
he can get it in one and a half years, two years, he can get the barrier formation. Here the vacant space is your cotton over there, over that the glass enema, and then the composite filling over that. Once the barrier has been obtained, and the observation. You can see the amount of gutta pacha over there. So the root is comparatively very thin. And this root can fracture if you go for a crown or if you go for a post or something on that particular tooth crown. And again, the crown root ratio you can see is comparatively less. So all these uh, things will limit our normal apexification with the calcium hydroxide, which we are active in. So we have new treatment modalities that I'll come to it in the subsequent slides. This also, ah, this is a case which I mentioned before that I have extended or I was lazy enough to uh, push the calcium hydroxide till up to the apex. So once you place the calcium hydroxide and before giving a permanent restoration, take a radiograph and see whether the calcium hydroxide has reached till up to the apex. If it has not reached till up to the apex, again push it with your instrument or again inject it. Make sure that you make uh, uh, reach or uh, uh, push the material till up to the apex. And what has happened over here? Apical constriction over here, I have got it. Here, it's not that great, but in the subsequent visit, I have got it. But when I have taken a work, uh, master code x ray, what I could see is that I was not able to negotiate that there is a calcific barrier over here, and my root canal is still open over there. If I obturate it, it will be short of apex. So, still, what I was, I have to take another one hour because of five minutes of laziness. I need to take another extra one hour for negotiating or bypassing that area and then placing and then uh, placing the cutter uh, person. So, my point over here is that if you are placing the calcium hydroxide, you need to place till up to the apex and make sure that it has reached till up to the apex with the help of a radiograph. Otherwise, you'll get if it is short of apex somewhere over here. Sometimes you may get the calcification over here, and the root enclosure sometimes over here. So root enclosure you might have got that here will be a vacant space. So if you obturate it here will be a vacant space will be there. So that is not acceptable. So you might need to further open up that uh, opening, and extra time will be wasted for that. And here also you can see that how much of the acidic cone has been placed because of the wide open canals. And that will compromise the tooth suction. This is again apexification and complete treatment. This is another key for the anterior tooth with an open apex with a periapical lesion. Also, is there you can see that it's been done in our department. Working length has been taken. Because of the lesion, what happens is that the material has been extruded out. And this material, what you can see is that after three months, it has been resorbed. So if at all the material get extruded, you don't need to worry. It will get resorbed within three months. But if it is extruded, you need to uh, caution the parent that there can be chance of pain. And you need to give an anti-inflammatory drug. Either a Brutman parastone will be sufficient once if you have extruded the material. Immediately, there will be slight uh, mobility for the tooth also will be there and uh, tendron percussion will be there for the first few days and automatically then it will subside. In some cases, if there is a sinus tract or something like that, this material get, get extruded through the sinus tract also. But within three months, this will be completely resolved and we will get a calcific barrier over there. So this is another case where you get a barrier dome shape, and finally, final obturation. Then, another option that is single visit uh, techniques, recent techniques, where the apex is almost closed. We can immediately close it rather than giving a calcium hydroxide, because if we give a calcium hydroxide apexification, it will take a longer time for the root and closure. 
along with the longer time the tooth also as the studies have said that the calcium hydroxide if it plays for a longer time that will compromise the um, what is it the strength of the root it will compromise the root and chance of fracture is more but so far i haven't seen any clinical cases reporting the fracture but there are many in vitro studies saying that the fracture resistance is comparatively less if you place calcium hydroxide apixification if you place calcium hydroxide for a longer time that will heal it and thereby thereby uh, that can fracture the tooth so in such instances a new option that is our mta can be placed and mta can be placed on those cases where the apex we cannot use in the blunderbuss canal it will be tough to use in a blunderbuss canal so we can use in the canal which is non blunderbuss or in the swex stage 3 i have mentioned before swex stage 1 2 3 4 and ideal one is a 4 that is apex almost closed but it is wide open then you can go for an mt apexification so that is an ideal case it is almost closed but you cannot confine your uh, gutta percha then you can go for a so mt has been placed in the apical region and then you have done the apexification or single visit apexification but it seems very simple and it uh, um, so those have done it might have experience it is a herculean task to place an mta in the apical area you have mixed it will be grainy or it will be watery and then you have, you have to use a messing gun and with the messing gun if you place it and then condense it what happens is it will get set you take a radiograph with the, the reach still up to the periapical area and many times what has happened is that till up to before reaching the periapex the material get harder and further pushing may not be possible if you how much of a push also so once you take a radiograph you can get a quality radiograph and other times what you can see is that if you push this material it might extrude a little bit or your mta which is being placed over there might get extruded and if it is get extruded it won't get resolved mta won't get resolved but since it's a biocompatible material, there won't be an issue at all. But still, when you take a radiograph or you know, when you see it, it may not be aesthetic. Uh, radiographically, it may not be aesthetic. So it is difficult to place MTA into the apical area. So that is the main disadvantage of the MTA. For that, we have different uh, equipments are there, uh, different uh, instruments are there. We have a messing gun that is curved one, straight one, smaller one, bigger, different diameters are available in the market. You can use such instruments to carry the MTA and then place it into the orifice. And after placing it to the orifice, you need hand plug drills to condense it. Or else you can use a butt end of your AT size that aperture can be used. But the best instrument what you can use is that uh, your mm, and plugger and what you can do is that you can hand plug it you can wet it because what happens is that when you place it onto the uh, um, mta the mta gets get stuck onto the hand plugger it will come along with that so for that you can just wet it but at the same time it should not be um, water particles should not be uh, it should not be um, what is that water should not be excess just wet it and then place it on your uh, gloves and then condense so that you don't stick on your uh, contents and then we can push it till up to the working length you have to estimate the working length initially and till up to that working length you can push your material till up to that working length and make it. and then take a radiograph and make sure that whether you have reached till up to the apex and another option what you can use is that this is a uh, technique by uh, this particular journal and this photograph is that particular journal that they have used resorbable filters which i have found very useful and what you can do is that you can take the resorbable vehicle switches can play multiple knots in that so we can make it into a ball set and that you can take it and then place it into the canal orifice and then condense it so that it can be condensed till up to the period so chance of material extruding out can be prevent it so we have a barrier which we have created and this barrier will be there 
and this barrier will help you. And even if it is being, uh, um, we need to push it very effectively. And that material is a resolvable material that will get automatically resolved for a period of time. So you don't have any difficulty in condensing the MTA into the periapical region. So we can get a better picture at the end. And again, this resolvable suture may not be visible because it is uh, radio opacity is not there. So to make it visible, what you can do is that you can wet this uh, resorbable suture and you can use a little bit of endofloss. You can just put it in the endofloss so that endofloss contain iodoform and that this iodoform will get, in, uh, get embedded into these knots. And once you take a radiograph, you can see that the radio is over there. So you can clearly identify whether you have reached beyond the apex or just at the apex you have reached it or not. And you can condense it properly and make it a barrier so that onto this barrier you can condense your uh, MTA still up to the apex so that your MTA won't get pushed beyond that. And then your gut aperture can be placed. So that is another um, good technique which can be followed. So, This case is reported to your clinic with a pain on 3-6. Severe pain, swelling, everything was there. And on uh, examination, what we could see is that the cave is a cave is exposure. On, on the contralateral side, what you can see is that that tooth also is cavelessly exposed, and it is because of the molar incised hypomineralization, as I mentioned before. And what you can he see over here is a pulp polyp is there, hyperplastic pulpitis is there. Open apex on either side, both the sides there is open apex. Here there is a periapical infection, everything is there, but here you cannot appreciate that much because the pulp polyp, which is sterile, there is no, uh, uh, the patient has no symptoms on this side. This side is only symptomatic for the patient. We have done an apexification. That apex has been placed. And as I mentioned before, if we don't give a crown for the patient or Normally what happens is that once the pain, everything has been controlled, patient may not report back. And this happens in your clinic, clinical practice and in the college also the same thing happens. Even if you recall the patient also, they won't come because their pain has been relieved. And what they feel is that the root canal has been done. Since you have done so many procedures, taken to radiograph, et cetera. And at times what happens is that you have charged for your root canal treatment also. So they feel that the root canal has been complete, they won't come back. So this is what happens, that the patient has reported with all the coronal filling, everything discharged, again reported with the pain and swelling on that particular area. So again, we have to redo the entire procedure and then we have to uh, create an apical seal and do the observation. So at the same time, what you can see, on the other side, that is where the pulp polyp was there, we have taken a radiograph, the root has closed. So the area where we have done a procedure, the root has not closed, the infection is still there, but on other area where we haven't touched it, the root has been completely closed, patient is asymptomatic, there is complete healing is there. So that is the beauty of what you can say is that if you provide an area where which is completely sterile, the root has a capacity for the normal root and closure. For the herbic epithelial tissue over there, or stem cells of apical area, have the capacity for the normal root closure. So here you can see that the open cavity, we have done our treatment here. We haven't done our treatment, but still there is a root closure. With that, I'll go our newer treatment modality that is revascularization. So the main disadvantage of our problem was time consuming and fracture of the tooth. And the crown root ratio is comparatively less. So with that, we cannot go for your, uh, we have limitations are there. 
So the new treatment option is there, that is our revascularization. And on which type of cases you can go for revascularization? You can go for revascularization for those cases in SWEC 1, 2, 3. You can go for the revascularization, where you can see a funnel shape of brown diverse canal. You go for revascularization rather than go for an apexification with MTA or with uh, yeah, calcium hydroxy if it is irreversibly damaged. Because if you do that, the end result will be something like this with reduced remaining tendon thickness. So the criteria according to Garcia Gode that apical opening should be more than one millimeter. Here it's more than that. The apical opening is wide open and it should be an end permanent tooth. That is before below 60 years it should be. So in such cases, you can go for your revascularization. That is for your SEC 1, 2, 3. SEC 1, 2, 3, till up to 4, you can go for your revascularization. Or your 5, you can go for your, uh, what is it, uh, MT apexification, you can go. And in some cases, you can even obturate with your bigger size your tobacco, you can obturate also. So in these three cases, it will be ideal, these four cases, it will be ideal to go for with your revascularization. And criteria for selection is age limited to 18 to 16 years, but even 41 years of age, they have uh, shown successful result. And there'll be continued root and formation. That is the advantage or beauty of this particular technique. Rather than getting a dome shaped apex or an apical barrier, here what we get is that here you will get the remaining dentin also, sufficient dentin thickness you'll get it, and complete root and closure also you'll get by this technique. And what all treatment? In this particular treatment, what all agents we can use it for irrigation? So sodium hypochlorite has to be used. It is a wonder solution in um, antibiotics, but the concentration has to be very careful because you are doing an open apex with wide open apex. So if you push the material beyond the apex, it can damage the Herdwig's epithelial root sheet and the apical stem cells. So what you need to use is that if you're using it, you have to confine the middle third fully and the uh, concentration of the sodium hypochlorite has to be. As the literature says, it should be 1.5 to 1.5 is sufficient. 0.5 also is sufficient for the canal disinfection. You should not use 5.2 three uh, concentration of uh, hypochlorate when you're planning to go for years. Chlorexidin, again, it is helpful for the EFE callus uh, in the secondary infection, but again, chlorexidin has to be used with caution because if it goes to the periapagal area or it can damage the Herdwig's epithelial root sheet, so that has to be very careful. UDKA has to be used as a last trigger in the case of revascularization because EDTA, 17% EDTA will help in regeneration or help in um, triggering the cells in the periapical area for what you can say is that uh, dendinogenesis or cementogenesis. So EDTA has to be used. So what you need to use is sodium hypochlorate, saline, chlorexidin can be used, EDTA, but these two solutions must be used for disinfecting the canal. And our main important importance should be given that the canal has to be disinfected. Once you disinfect the canal and make the canal free of any infection, then the tooth or the root apex have the capacity for the normal development. It will develop and you don't need to bother anything further. So how can you disinfect the canal? Already infected root canal, how can you disinfect it? For that, you need to use topical antibiotics. While systemic antibiotics is not that useful is that, this tooth is non-vital. Non-vital tooth doesn't have any blood supply into that area. So if you take orally, or if you take of antibiotics, it's of not much use because it will reach to the bloodstream and it will reach only the periapical area. It cannot go into the root canal orifice or into the root canal system and or into the dental tubules and kill the microorganism. 
because there is no blood supply over there because the tooth is not vital. If there is blood supply, there will be continued root formation is there. So we need antibiotics that is in the topical area. So the antibiotics what you can use is ciprofloxacillin, metronazole, and minocycline of concentration 200 milligram, 500 milligram, and 100 milligram. This is, uh, this is a um, fortunate uh, protocol by uh, protocol given for triple antibiotic base. But unfortunately, we may not get ciprofloxacillin 200 milligram. We'll get only ciprofloxacillin 250 milligram. And metronazole 500, we don't have it. We have only 400, 200 tablets. Minocycline, of course, we'll get it 50 and 100 milligram tablets are available. So what we can do is that we can mix it by 250 milligram, four tablets. If you take it, you can make it into 1,000. The minocycline, we can make it into five tablets. So you can multiply it into five and make it that concentration. So metronidazole, what you can do is that 400 milligram, six tablets, and 200 milligram, half tablet, so that you can get the desired. So you can make one needs to one concentration, that proper one needs to one concentration, you can make it. With this uh, 200, which is not available, you may not get the one needs to one concentration. By making it into this way, you can make it into one needs to one concentration. And from each, uh, that is the prophylaxis in the And this has to be stored in a separate airtight bottle with a butter paper. So there should not be any moisture contamination. I'll come to you later how you have to uh, prepare this. Uh, you can take the tablet. You have to scrape that entry coating. All the tablet will contain, even the tablet will contain an entry coating that is uh, helpful for swallowing. So that entry coating has to be removed with your scalp. So you can see a shiny surface that has to be removed. Once you remove the shiny surface, what you can see is that you will get a ragged board or something like this. And then this is a shiny surface, what you can see that's a prophylaxis of 250 milligram. And then you have to powder it with your motor and this. You have to nicely powder it. And after powdering it, you can store it in a butter paper. This, that quantity has to be stored in butter paper and place it in a airtight container so that whenever you need it, you can take equal mixture of all the three powders, that is ciprofloxacillin, metronazole, and uh, minocycline. Equal mixture, you can take it, and then you can add the propylene glycol. That is very much important for your revascularization procedure. You can mix it with saline also, but the disadvantage is that propylene glycol will help you to penetrate into the dental tubules, which is much more important because your microorganisms might be embedded into the dental tubule. This propylene glycol will have the capacity to be in the base form and it is easy to place and it will go into the, or macrogol has to be used. Propylene glycol, you can mix it with the propylene glycol, you'll get a creamy mix that has to be placed into the pulp canal space. And when you're placing it, Make sure that it should be into the canal orifice rather than into the pulp chamber. If you place it into the pulp chamber, chance of discoloration will be more. You can see that yellow discoloration of the mix. This uh, mixture itself, this is white in color. And once minocycline has been mixed, that yellow color will be there. And once you place it into the oral cavity, after some times, you can see this yellow discoloration and the tooth will be discolored. So to prevent that discoloration, what you can do is that you can place this mix into the orifice that is not into the pulp chamber rather than it can you can push it into the uh, root canal and then you can place a cotton over there over that you can place an interim therapeutic restoration and over the interim therapeutic restoration to prevent the discoloration again what you can do is that the entire chamber can be coated with a bonding agent and after that bonding agent then you can keep a composite so that the uh, dissolution of the minocycle into the dental tubules and thereby discoloration can be avoided. Or else, if it is an anterior tooth with aesthetics of much of concern, you can avoid minocycle. That is also possible. We can use two-phase system or separate can be uh, used, or you can use uh, ciprofloxacin and metronidazole alone also can be sufficient. Where you are using this three mixture is that you need to kill all the microorganisms. If you use a single microorganism or single antibiotic, it may not kill all the microorganisms. You need to kill all the microorganisms and you don't want any other microorganisms. Ciprofloxacin is used because 
these are the two teeth in the oral cavity. There are multiple uh, microorganisms in the gastrointestinal tract which will get embedded into the root canal system. So to remove that E. coli everything, we need uh, ciprofloxacin. So that can that has to be used. And uh, minocycline is a broad spectrum one, and metronosol is for the anaerobic infection. And once you place this, and one of the canal is been disinfected, that is for four weeks, then you need to create a scaffold for your root canal formation or your root and formation. That scaffold, either you can get it by inducing the bleeding. I think you can see the bleeding over here, or else plasma rich fibrin can be used, plated rich uh, fibrin can be used, or else you can use synthetic scaffolds also can be used. But these two materials can be used easily in our clinic. And this one is very easy, that is bleeding, which can be easily induced. PRF is much more effective, but only disadvantage is that you need to draw the blood from the patient, and then immediately it has to be centrifuged. You need a centrifuging kit in your department, uh, in your uh, clinic. So that costs only a 5,000 rupees for you. Uh, that can be easily uh, procured, and you can use it readily available, and that has to be used. Uh, yeah. Or else you can induce bleeding. And if you're inducing bleeding, there is a question whether to use plain LA or with adrenaline. The literature has said that it has to be uh, plain LA because if the adrenaline is there, that will reduce the circulation over there and thereby the bleeding will be difficult or to induce bleeding will be difficult. But uh, I haven't uh, find any difficulty because in the most of the cases we are doing it in a wide open apex so uh, bleeding, inducing bleeding may not be that difficult because the plain LA, the expiry date will be comparatively less. And what happens with the plain LA is that the anesthetic effect will be very less or the time duration will be very less. So if you are using plain LA, just before inducing the bleeding, you need to give one more injection, infiltration over there so that when you're inducing the bleeding, the patient may not have pain. Otherwise, when you're inducing the bleeding, the patient may complain of the pain. Or else, he can use with adrenaline. So with adrenaline, there won't be any issue at all. So if at all, if you have an option of getting PRF, that is the best option right now, that has to be done with the anticoagulant, without the anticoagulant. So you have to draw the blood immediately. You have to centrifuge it, and then you can use it. But Sometimes what happens is that after sending, you have to do the centrifuging immediately before the placement of your PR. If you keep it for a longer time, what happens is that again, it will become watery. It has happened for us at times, if it takes some more time for the placement, it will become watery and you may be able to place it. So to prevent that, what you can do is that again, you can re-centrifuge it and then you. So to prevent that, uh, prevent that watery consistency, immediately before loading it, you can Centrifuging. And certain dental materials which has to be used over the uh, PR or over the bleeding is that we are not supposed to use dentin bonding agents or glass cyanamos or any such cements. Biocompatible cements such as MTA is the best material. If discoloration is an issue, you can use for biodentin. And calcium hydroxide also can be used, uh, but never use your uh, total edge technique, that is your uh, uh, composite directly. Sealers also is not uh, this one. Amalgam and glass cyanamus also is not that acceptable. So the best material what you can place over that scaffold is your uh, uh, MTA or biodent. We go to the procedure. And there is a question whether we are getting revascularization or regeneration or repair. But commonly what we can see is that if it is regeneration, the pulp has to be formed, the dentin has to be formed, the cementum has to be formed. But normally what we see is that there is cementum-like tissue or dentin-like tissue over there, and there is continued root formation. So what ideally we can say is that it will be repair rather than regeneration, or it can be revascularization, some amount of 
revascularization is happening over there. So the case which has been reported to our department with an open apex, you can see that the canine with the open apex, the irrigation protocol that is sodium hypochlorate, saline, and finally PDTA has been used, which will help in the regeneration. Following that, the PRF has been uh, made. And after getting the PRF, it has been carefully removed with the tooth uh, forceps. You can remove the PRF, that is by holding. Over here, you can remove the PRF. And once you place it over the gauze, and then it has to be blotted, thoroughly blotted. And once you blot it, you'll get a fibrin, something like this, which you can condense it. And in this one, what you can see that here is the red area and the white area. This area, which contains high amount of pluripotent cells, or cells which has the capacity for uh, regeneration. So this uh, tissue or this uh, part of the PRF has to be placed onto the apical area rather than this area. So this should go into the apical area and this part should be in the coronal area. So in that way, you need to condense it into the cavity. And after condensing it, after placing it into the uh, root canal system, and this is finally placed, because this is really loose and you cannot see that, an MTA is placed and, uh, and over an MTA, you have to place a cotton uh, pellet for the complete setting that is cotton pellet and glass and instrument. So in the subsequent visit, what you can see is that this was the blunderbuss canal initially, what you can see. Here, what you can see that there is slight constriction, what you can appreciate it that the root is getting closed. Rather than getting a blunderbuss canal, here an apical closure, you are getting it. And, and remaining dentin thickness, here you can see that the dentin is very thin over here. Here you are getting a thicker dentin. So that means that root is developing, which is much favorable than your mentioned apexification, empty apexification. This is a case which we have done it. Uh, revascularization by uh, clotting, um, that is blood clot. And later what we have done is that we need to go for a crown for this particular case. So we have reopened it and uh, checked what has happened inside it. And what the material what we have got is that it is red blood cells. There is no other tissue we could get it. We didn't get any pulp tissue or we didn't get any uh, neural tissue. What we got is red blood cells we got it. So uh, this is the one which we got it in the department. So uh, what I would like to say is that it's not the regeneration. We cannot completely say regeneration is happening over there. No, it can be revascularization or repair that will be happening over there. For the studies is still required on this particular area about whether it is revascularization or re repairing. So this is another case where bleeding has been induced. MT has been placed and you can see this was the initial case where wide open apex and now the root is closing, the patient is still under review. So within another, and one thing what I have noticed is that it will take a longer time than the adjacent tooth for the apex uh, root and closure. That is if you are going for a revascularization, uh, what I have, we have seen is that the apical closure is taking a little more uh, more time than that of the normal closure, but still we can get a normal closure. Do the PRF on that before we are blotting it. And when you're explaining about this procedure, you need to inform the parent and get the consent also, because this is a new procedure. You have to draw the blood from that. And you know that it may not be, sometimes they can be failed also. If failure is there, we can go for your conventional apexification procedure by MTA or your white apex can be used. So this is a new technique by which we can get the revascularization, we can get the root and closure uh, in a proper way. That will be much more beneficial for the patient. And uh, in the future also, that will be beneficial. So that in, um, message has to be clarified to the parent, and then you can go for this procedure. Most of the parents, I haven't uh, got any negative, uh, this one from these pa patients and uh, parents. 
because they definitely when they say that it's an alternative to the root canal treatment definitely they'll go for that only thing is that you need to draw the blood these sort of complications are there but still this is the best procedure right now what we can use and whether to go for extraction so this is a case where we see that an young permanent tooth with a um, grossly decayed crown structure and if the patient compliance is not that great you can consider extraction rather than going for an apexification or revascularization or anything you can go for extraction that is also an option in the case of permanent molar provided you have your third molar intact and your second molar is in the verge of what is that what you can see is that the cervical part is at to form at this stage if the root is formed then it is better to go for a root uh, for a apexification of this because once the root is formed the chance of this tooth migrating to this area will be less otherwise if you extract this particular tooth what happens is that in this particular stage this tooth will migrate nicely and thereby completely that space will be closed so you don't feel that there was a permanent first molar present so the second molar will come to this space and the third molar will occupy the second molar position and finally you can see that you don't need any treatment so that is also an another option for the molars provided if the root development of second molar is uh, uh, in the cervical that is at this stage and along with that the third molar is present and the premolars are within the uh, within inside the crypt or in, inside the roots of your second deciduous molar then you can go for this this option extraction is also a final or is also an option and the option you can give it to the parent so to conclude our procedure should be minimally invasive or as throughout my uh, presentation i have told as minimally invasive as possible we should be so that we have to retain the vitality of the pulp as much as possible if you have any chance to maintain the vitality you need to maintain it if you maintain it that will help the pulp for the continued root formation so the pediatric dentist has to focus upon the other part that is the preventive dentistry also that is which we uh, neglected or we don't so that part we have to emphasize that is the prevention also has to be taken care of and the other conservative and endodontic because this endodontics is also involved so normally uh, people are called as endodontists rarely they are called as conservative dentists so the conservation has to be uh, keeping in mind when you are treating an impermanent tooth so the preventive and conservation of tooth has to be kept in mind so the take home message is that if you have a wide open apex in stage 1 2 3 right revascularization if you have apex almost closed you can go for mt apexification and if it is completely closed or it is uh, my opening can go for your conventional obturation so i have uh, thank you thank you for your patient listening any questions my thanks goes to uh dr coach dr deepak jus shania dr matthew v lakshmi kartika tina arjun and to all the post graduate students of our department both the uh, present post graduate students and the previous post graduate students whose cases i have shown uh, during this presentation and most importantly i feel that post graduate students are our teachers because they are the one who uh, initiate us for uh, extra reading one thing and the new protocols and new trends when they present in the journal clubs and seminars uh they will teach us so a special thanks goes to our, both the uh alumni of our so uh, this one what is that um pedo uh, and also the present post graduate students thank you dr anand judge for the excellent presentation
and beautifully explaining the various treatment options for young permanent tooth, including the most recent trends using an evidence-based approach. Mm -hmm. And many practical difficulties and problems that we face in our clinical practice has been clearly explained with documented cases. And now the forum is open for discussion. You can type your queries in the chat box. And before going for discussion, I would like to invite our beloved chairman, Dr. P.S. Taha, for sharing your valuable thoughts. So, Dr. Anandraj, Dr. Ampli, yes, and all the participants. I really <clears throat> congratulate Dr. Anandraj for the wonderful presentation. I feel it was a very extensive presentation, which is, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, you should have said something related to, you know, which the possibilities of doing in a, for a general practitioner. Okay. But anyway, this is a very extensive presentation and very, very informative and uh, really wonderful. And uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, something which is at a postgraduate level. Okay. And uh, I wish because periodontists are not very easily available all over Kerala. Okay. I would suggest that there should be a, some workshop to be conducted for the general practitioners with a limited possibilities of doing at least, you know, uh, 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 you know, <clears throat> uh, some procedures which can be uh, done within the limits of the general practitioner. Okay, that will be beneficial for the society. Okay, otherwise, you know, looking for a periodontist, you know, going for a long distance with a child, you know, it may not be possible. So anyway, very nice presentation, very extensive presentation. I was, I really got a, a very latest knowledge on the development of pediatric dentistry and the possibility of saving, uh, 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 you know, uh, permanent tooth. Okay, so uh, nice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Anandaraj, Ampli, and all for making this presentation wonderful. Thank you. Uh, there are some queries already in the chat box. Uh, some questions from Dr. Reshmi. What was the rationale for splinting the tooth for a longer time? And for how long was the splinting plan initially for the seven-year-old child? Uh, yeah, it has to be for uh, more than eight weeks. It has to be uh, because in this particular case, there was no root formation was not there. So the splinting was there for more than uh, four months, I think. More than four months, it was there in the oral cavity. The splinting was there. Okay, uh, so there is another question. With respect to clinical and radiographic success rate, which material is better, MTA or biodentin? Uh, biodentin is much better uh, by, because what we can say is that manipulation-wise, MTA has a literature, uh, what is that, review, literature says that MTA is better, but still, uh, you taking into all the consideration, I feel that biodentin should be the material of choice because of the uh, color discoloration and for the placement, all these things, biodentin is a better material. But only a difficulty what uh, we feel is at the cost of the material. Because if you take that entire capsule, ideally what they say is that entire capsule has to be used. But practically what we all does is that we'll open up the capsule and a little bit of uh, powder has been taken and then it has been mixed. But ideally, it is not um, correct because you don't get the correct consistency. So the cost is only really difficult. Otherwise, if the cost is not a factor, then biodentin is the best material, especially in the anterior tooth, where uh, you can get uh, what you get, discoloration or uh, this one. Otherwise, uh, MTA, the long-term studies, everything says that MTA is better. There are equal, uh, this one is that MTA is better than biodentin. So there is one more question from Dr. Rishmi, uh, which will be the best theory again for pulpotomy procedures. Pulpotomy procedures, sodium hypochlorate. Saline plus sodium hypochlorate, you can use it, but we don't need to use uh, uh, the chlorexylin or any other irrigations. Saline plus sodium hypochlorate will be sufficient. So there are, there are some more questions. Saline needs to flush out the debris, everything. And sodium hypochlorate is to disinfect the canal. If there is, suppose if you have any uh, microbes which has been over there, it can disinfect it. And along with that, it can control the bleeding to an extent also. 
So uh, then how to decide if one should go for direct pulp capping or Swix uh, pulpotomy? Depending upon the type. So if it is within 24 hours, if the patient reports to you within 24 hours, you can go for the direct pulp capping. Okay. And if you feel that, uh, if you see that the bleeding is being can control, or if you can control bleeding and it is asymptomatic, asymptomatic in a sense means once you touch over that area, the patient will have pain. And uh, if it is clean, then you can go for a direct pulp capping. And uh, if I, uh, if you ask me what is my personal opinion, I'd go for a miniature pulpotomy then. Because a little bit more of pulp tissue, if I remove it, I'll be a little more confident enough to say that the uh, pulp tissue underneath is vital. And along with that, I can place a material over there and then I can give a restoration, which will be much more easier for me rather than placing a dical and then glass enema so that uh, uh, my uh, area for restoration will be limited, especially in the anterior tooth. So in such case, I would prefer a miniature pulpotomy, not a sweat pulpotomy, a miniature, a little bit of pulp tissue is removed, there, I can place a calcium hydroxide, biodendin, or something over there. Then the glass enema, and then remaining area, I can use it for my bonding of my composite. So there is a request from Sukanya. Uh, could you please repeat uh, MTA use in which, which stage of spec root development? That is, we can use in the stage four. That is, when the root is almost closed. Or in the three stage also, you can use it. But at the stage three, what happens is that uh, your dentin will be comparatively thin there and we have a wide open apex. So to confine the material to the apex, as I mentioned before, you need to use a uh, material, uh, uh, what you can say is that um, your resorbable switch or something over there to get a barrier. So it is difficult, technically difficult, but if it is almost closed, then it will be easier for you to place the material over there. So I personally prefer when it is in the SWEX stage four, he can go for MDI apexification. There is an interesting question from Dr. Shibi. Uh, in apexification, among the two mistakes wherein calcium hydroxide goes beyond apex and one wherein it's too short, which is the lesser of the two evils? Whether to go beyond the apex or mm -hmm. to be short of the apex? If you go beyond the apex, you will get a, uh, what you can get, barrier, you will get a, definitely you'll get a barrier. That's for sure. Huh? But if you go short of the apex, you'll get a barrier in between which you will have difficulty in negotiating it. You know that a calcified canal... Already you have, have explained that yeah, difficulty yeah. in one case. So it will be better till up to the apex. If you go till up to the apex, that will be the best one. Sir, so, uh, can you explain the difference between reversible and irreversible pulpitis based on the symptoms and signs? Uh, reversible pulpitis, what you can say is that the pain which has happened is uh, what you can say is that uh, on a, a stimulus, suppose if you have taken a sweet food or if you have taken a cold food or a hot food, the pain is there and that pain can be removed immediately, immediately in a sense within 5 to 10 seconds. If it gets removed, then you can say that it is a reversible pulpitis. The pain which won't linger. Uh, which will stay only for 5 to 10 seconds. So when, if you are brushing, you get a pain. So when you stop that, if there is no pain, it's fine. Or when you rinse that oral cavity, if there is no pain, it's okay. Or when you take a cold ice cream, you get a pain. And when you stop eating that, immediately the pain subsides. That's an ideal uh, case of irreversible pulpitis. Uh, re reversible pulpitis. But at the same time, if the pain lasts for half an hour, 10 minutes, or more than that, then it is fine of irreversible pulpitis. Or if you have taken any medication to control that pain, then it is irreversible pulpitis. Or if the pain which is caused by cold, for example, if you have taken a cold water and the pain is there, and that has been relieved by hot, then it is not an ideal indicator. Then it may be an irreversible pulpitis. Or pulp is going a irreversible change. Or if the patient gives the history of pain while taking hot water, again, it is a sign of irreversible pulpitis. Then, of course, the night pain, uh, continuous pain, all those things without any provocation pain is there. Uh, again, getting up early in the morning and the patient complains of the pain, or in the middle of the night, patient complains of the pain, or continuous pain, all these things are signs of irreversible pulpitis. Then, tend on percussion, those are things. Then, it has gone beyond the effects, irreversible pulpitis definitely you can identify. And, sir, one last question What is the consistency of biodentin for vital pulp therapy? 
ideally what it is it has to be creamy mix creamy mix um, i didn't have the photograph that uh, uh, like a glass enema it has to be you can take it easily like if, what you can say that uh, a type 2 glass enema if you mix it you will get a creamy type of mix that mix will be ideal for uh, ideally uh, you can use it so that you can place it into the chamber you can confine it to the area where you need exactly you have to place it and then use it you can place it so that we have to be little um, tricky enough in your mixing that is if you are not using I, uh, otherwise you have to use the entire capsule you have to use it uh, if you use the entire capsule you will get that proper consistency otherwise you have to be little careful when mixing it to get a creamy consistency so that I you think can, uh, huh, you can just lift it uh, once you lift it, it it has to stick along your with the instrument I think the uh, speaker has clearly explained all the queries. And I once again congratulate Dr. Anand Raj for the excellent presentation. And I take this opportunity to uh, thank all the participants who have spared your valuable time and for the active participation in the discussion. So I hope uh, all of you have benefited and we can conclude the session today. With that, we can conclude the session. Yeah. Are there thank, any you, sir. thank you, sir, for giving me an opportunity uh, to present this webinar.